Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com. And New Jersey Society of CPAs, committed to the integrity, objectivity, competence, and professionalism of CPAs and the quality of their services. This week, are we just inches away? Congress tries to reach a stimulus deal, and one New Jersey lawmaker thinks it will happen soon. Plus, with legal marijuana comes an emerging industry, and that means new jobs. So what will a career in cannabis look like in New Jersey? And vaccines, hospital finances, and innovation. Our deep dive this week takes a look at the business behind New Jersey's healthcare industry and the unprecedented impact of the pandemic. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat, a new show taking a deeper look at the stories, trends, and influencers shaping New Jersey's business landscape each week. And while you're here, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. We begin with the mounting frustration of many New Jersey residents and businesses over the inability for things to get done in Washington, where talks go on and on over another emergency COVID relief package. Late this week, I caught up with New Jersey Congressman Josh Gottheimer to find out what the holdup is. He's a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, the bipartisan group that proposed a new $908 billion relief package and helped jumpstart the latest round of talks. Congressman Gottheimer, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Where do things stand right now with these stimulus talks? It seems like there was some promise early on, but now there have been some roadblocks. Well, you know, we've been working on trying to get here for nine months, right, since the last package. So, of course, you know, getting to the ultimate deal is uh, there's going to be roadblocks along the way, but actually we're making very good progress. Uh, you know, we're, we're actually within inches, a couple remaining issues that we're working on. And, and I'll tell you that if we, uh, if we do what we must do, we're going to get this done in the next week uh, so that people, as we head into the holidays, uh, are able to, to know that we're going to get another round of unemployment for them, for those who are out of work. And we know so many people are out of work right now. It's a very tough time. Additional resources for those who are hungry, uh, small businesses, another package of relief, which is critically important to so many of our small businesses. So, and more resources for testing. We, we've got to get this done. So what are the big sticking points at this moment? The biggest point remains uh, working uh, out the liability and worker protection language uh, for the legislation. You know, we that, that's 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 critical for the Republicans to agree to uh, more resources for our state and local governments. As you know, in New Jersey, so many of our 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 towns are are hurting right now. There's and our state as well in terms of revenue shortages and huge expenditures from COVID. Uh, that if we're going to uh, have the resources to Pay for law enforcement, our firefighters, and our teachers. We need more help. You know, we're we're probably somewhere around the 15 to 20 billion dollar range in the hole as a state. So it's, a, it's a, a huge hit from COVID to our economy. That's in addition, of course, to what we're facing on the on the health crisis front. So uh, that, that that's really the the part that we have to work out. I just got off a phone call with a group of senators. Now we're trying to work out that language. As you know, there's been this group of us who, uh, uh, both in the House and the Senate, the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I co-chair, 50 members, half Democrat, half Republican in the House, working closely with our uh, bipartisan Senate colleagues. You know, I watched all of your news conferences in the Problem Solvers Caucus when the $908 billion package was first introduced. There was a follow-up news conference. And quite frankly, you can see the frustration among members of that group uh, in terms of getting things done. For people that watch that and are sitting at home and are like, hey, why can't this just happen? Why is there such a hurdle in just moving forward in a bipartisan way? I mean, you just said it perfectly. It's beyond frustrating. 
I mean, those of us who think you should sit down, you should figure it out. You're going to not get everything you want. You have to accept that. But the bottom line is you have to help people and you got to fight for the people you represent. And people are hurting. You know, we've got 200,000 people a day who are being diagnosed, thousands dying. We hit another unfortunate marker yesterday. We know that uh, nationally in terms of loss of life, we've had the same we're seeing in New Jersey, the caseload just keep going up with it in this latest spike. A third of uh, our small businesses in New Jersey have already gone out. 23% of restaurants in New Jersey have gone out of business. So many jobs and families are hurting, not to mention, as you, as you know, you look at the food lines, people at food pantries for the first time ever uh, because they're hurting. You've got people facing eviction notices in the, the right after Christmas. So we have to help. You know, There's no excuse. There's no reason why we can't get it done. But those people, there's people on the uh, uh, extremes who just think that it's, it's better to do nothing. You've got a lot of uh, members of Congress and the Senate from red states who think we shouldn't help out the blue states. You've got some of that going on. Others who say we don't really have a crisis. But you look at these numbers right as we're in the edge of going into flu season and Christmas, you know, and, and, the, the, and the toughest times with, with the weather getting cold and people inside and the numbers going up. We're so close to a vaccine getting distributed to not help people through this toughest time, to not get that vaccine out well and, and not make sure that we can, our economy can get through this and we can get through this and from a healthcare perspective is unacceptable. And so our position has been pretty simple. We're not going home uh, for our holidays at the end of this year until we get this done. So we're continuing to work 24 seven until we find uh, a solution and I know not everyone's going to love it. I got it. It's but it's an emergency short-term relief package meant to get us through this, get us through these early months of winter, get us into a new administration, and then we can get more relief for for our families, our states, and our our communities and our businesses. And Congressman, I just want to be clear: is there definitely a plan to help unemployed workers? Is there bipartisan agreement on that? Is that not a sticking point? No, that, that's, you know, in, in our group, our bipartisan group, which is, again, 50 members of the House, plus uh, we're now up to about 12 or 14 members of the Senate. And again, other people who are not in our, com in our direct conversations, but this is the group that's been working on the $908 billion package, uh, this bipartisan, bicameral working group. In that group, um, there's support for $300 a week supplemental unemployment uh, for 16 weeks. And it's an extension of, of those, you know, there's a time limit usually for how long you've been on unemployment. It extends that time limit as well. But is that going to fly in the Senate based on what yeah, well, right well, and this is a group of bipartisan senators who were supporting that. So it's not just the House, it's the senators. Yeah, I mean, that's, there was a counter proposal made by the White House, uh, I guess, two days ago that left out unemployment. Uh, which is unacceptable. And, and uh, there's Democrats and Republicans, we all agree it's unacceptable. These people are out of work and need help right now. And we've got to we've got to help them uh, and do whatever we can to make sure they can get through this tough time. And finally, Congressman, one item not uh, that we should expect, I guess, is stimulus checks, correct? That looks like that would not happen based on where things stand. You're trying to fight for everything you can get. The, this is uh, in this package, not there. But again, this is a down payment. This is a first bite of the apple. Uh, we're going to need, I believe, to do more uh, when we get back into a new administration, we're in a new administration and back into the new year. This is supposed to be an emergency short-term relief package to get us through those first months of the new year into the new administration and help people through this spike right now that we're facing as a country. So, Congressman, I want to thank you very much for your time, for your efforts. I'm going to say goodbye so you can get back to work on that. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. And I, I really appreciate it. I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. And we will get there. And uh, please uh, have faith. We need the prayers here. We'll get it done. As we wait for word on whether more money is coming, New Jersey businesses are just trying to get through another day, another week, and hopefully another month. Sadly, NJBIA President and CEO Michelle Sukurka says many just can't hang on, as our Leah Mishkin found out this week. We are 30% decrease of number of businesses in the state of New Jersey uh, over January of this year. President and CEO of New Jersey Business and Industry Association Michelle Sukurka says it's predominantly Main Street businesses 
that have closed. Big complaint I've been hearing throughout this pandemic is when some businesses were deemed essential, they tended to be those big box stores versus the little store. The impact is the fact that, you know, businesses were not able to stay open in the beginning. The second thing is that, you know, we had such a delayed reopening in New Jersey. And business doesn't like one thing, and that's uncertainty. The Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey represents about 900 different companies. President Anthony Russo explains many business owners are hopeful the incoming vaccines can help prevent another lockdown. The other thing, too, that we're watching and monitoring is we're hoping that Washington passes another stimulus bill because one of the things that did help back in the spring was the Paycheck Protection Program, was that stimulus money kept people employed, kept the economy going. That dried up over the summer. How many more companies are on the brink of closure? Any business that's tied into the hospitality sector clearly has been impacted. You got to think about that supply chain, right? So if it's restaurants, hotels, it's not just the employees, the owners there, but it's all the vendors that rely on that customer. The accountant, the banker, the plumber, the linens, you know, supplier. That was Leah Mishkin reporting. The New Jersey Restaurant and Hospitality Industry Association shares the concern that more restaurants and hotels could close, potentially putting thousands of people out of work. A virtual press conference on the state of the industry included members of our congressional delegation who acknowledged it's bad out there and they need to take action. When we have a crisis in our country, the vulnerable communities are truly suffering and we're seeing what's happening uh, to black and brown businesses in our state, uh, which do not have the same access to capital often. It would be unconscionable, I think all of us agree, to leave, for Congress to leave without doing our part, our responsibility here, not as the public health authority, but as the masters of the purse, the, 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 the authority that has the ability to say that our restaurants can get through the winter even as we ask them to make these kinds of sacrifices. Will a new stimulus package provide any relief for state and local governments? They need it. Our John Reitmeyer reports that New Jersey's municipalities are facing rising pension costs this year. You know what that means? You could be hit with an increase in your property taxes. And they're still gauging exactly how this will be dealt with, but because of the way that municipal and county governments are funded in New Jersey, you know, usually it, wrote, it, it comes down to two different things. Either property taxes go up or some sort of services get cut to offset, you know, what looks like in some cases a 10% year over year increase in cost. And so it could be property taxes go up a little bit more than maybe we were expecting. Some, some service gets reduced, a combination of those factors. I think it'll depend on the location and just how uh, big of a hit they're, they're taking specifically. On NJ Business Beat, we continue to keep our eye on New Jersey's growing marijuana industry. This week, Stockton University teamed up with two cannabis business organizations and held a virtual cannabis career fair. We asked Edmund DeVoe, president of the New Jersey Cannabis Association, what kind of jobs are available? With the New Jersey Cannabis Association, we're very proud to have a, a diverse membership. We have members that are accountants, attorneys, engineers, IT specialists. Uh, we have real estate members as well. And the good news is that the cannabis industry will require all of those uh, uh, skills and, uh, and expertise. So if you're a student, uh, one of the things that we're proud to, to share with, with them is that uh, regardless of your, your degree, whether it's in environmental science, uh, communications, uh, you will probably find an opportunity in the cannabis industry. The cannabis industry is an emerging one in New Jersey, but one industry with deep roots in our state is in the midst of an unprecedented challenge. In our deep dive this week, we dig into New Jersey's healthcare industry and the devastating impact of the pandemic. First, some good news. There's hope that a newly approved coronavirus vaccine will start to bring our COVID health and economic crisis to a close. Late Thursday, a key FDA panel recommended emergency use approval for a COVID-19 vaccine made by Pfizer and BioNTech. 
New Jersey is expected to receive 76,000 doses of the vaccine right away. By the end of this year, Governor Murphy says we'll receive 300 to 500,000 doses. The state plans to initially inoculate 600,000 first responders, as well as New Jersey's 75,000 nursing home residents. More dosings will follow once more supply is available. The state has set an ambitious goal of trying to immunize 70% of New Jersey's eligible population by April or May. I talked with Debbie Hart, president and CEO of BioNJ, about the vaccine's unique path to approval and how New Jersey's pharma and biotech industry played a role. Debbie, it's been, it seems a very long time coming to actually see vaccines come on the market, but actually it's been a very, very short time from research and development to actually getting vaccines out there. How has this process been very unique compared to what typically happens? Relatively speaking, you are absolutely right, Rhonda. It seems like an eternity, right? Because we're all waiting with bated breath and we're all forced to stay home or limit our activities on some level. And so, you know, when you look at though the normal drug development process, the normal vaccine approval process, it's really been um, minimized down to the really the bare minimum. At the same time, I cannot stress strongly enough the fact that safety and efficacy and the assurance of that have not been compromised in any way. The process has just been basically compressed, but all of the same steps and protocols and procedures and assurances and the monitoring by the FDA and other government entities has happened all along the way. What role did New Jersey companies play in the research and development and and getting us to this point? That's really one of my favorite topics always when, you know, when I get to talk about our New Jersey companies, I think what they've done in COVID has just been absolutely extraordinary for a disease we didn't even know about just a year, about a year ago, right? Um, Little, little under at this point, our company stepped up in just a major way. So first of all, Globally, there are 777 different programs addressing COVID, whether it be vaccines, therapeutics, or testing. Our companies, more than 70 of them, stepped up right off the bat and have been doing their own part to deliver therapies, cures, vaccines, treatments, testing, et cetera. And our academic institutions as well. Remember, very early on, Rutgers discovered and developed and got approval for a saliva testing uh, uh, kit. So um, we're very proud of all of all of them. It's such a good point to raise because I think, you know, the big companies are the ones really in the headlines now. And perhaps people don't realize how much effort actually happened here in New Jersey with companies whose names we're not familiar with. For sure, for sure. Um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, right, starting at the biggest and then down to some of the smaller companies like Oncosec and uh, Insmed and Sologenics, they're all doing, you know, they all have research programs aimed at COVID as well. So yes, it's been, you know, the industry does what it always does, right? It steps up to uh, address, uh, you know, what's needed, what patients need and, and to get it there as quickly as possible is, is what they live for. What has the industry learned from the COVID experience, Debbie, in your view? Yeah, it's been very interesting. In fact, we are going through an analysis of that right now and more is yet to be written. However, um, you know, there are certainly learnings that we do hope that this will all not be for naught and that will take with us. For example, you know, the way companies collaborated together, the way they collaborated with academic institutions, the way government collaborated with companies was just extraordinary. And we do hope that a lot of that will will be carried on as well. Um, The use of, of real world evidence and data to make decisions and bring things faster uh, forward faster was critical. And again, we hope that things like that will be, we will be kept as well. When people see how quickly this need, you know, in relative terms was addressed, it makes you wonder, there's so many other diseases uh, out there. Can we see this kind of rapid research and development method be repeated? Or is this something that we might just see because this situation was so unusual? 
Well, we certainly hope that again, many of the things that we learned in this process will be kept. Um, that, you know, there was an extraordinary amount, you know, give credit to government, an extraordinary, an extraordinary amount of, of funding that came forward to help make this happen. Um, and hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, getting things to patients faster means that healthcare costs are cut more quickly. Um, and so we hope that again, a lot of this can be retained and that it will, um, it will continue to make a difference for patients um, long into the future in a faster, more efficient way. Debbie, thank you so much. My pleasure, Rhonda, thank you. And please stay safe, stay well, and stay home whenever you can. For New Jersey's hospitals, the arrival of a vaccine is welcome news as they are faced with a rising number of COVID patients. Predictive models released by the Murphy administration this week show that in a worst case scenario, hospitalizations would surpass the peak that the state saw last spring. While trying to provide the best of care for patients, hospitals at the same time must deal with financial fallout due to the spike in coronavirus cases. Sean Hopkins, an executive with the New Jersey Hospital Association, told me how bad it's been and what may lie ahead. Sean, COVID-19 has been devastating in so many ways, and it's also created some economic hardship for New Jersey's hospitals. A few weeks back, the association put out a report that kind of detailed the revenue declines we saw across the state. Can you give us some highlights from that report? And more importantly, tell me how hospitals are now. Absolutely. Um, you know, hospitals in New Jersey are roughly a $25 billion a year industry. So that's about $2 billion a month in revenue uh, coming into those facilities. Uh, when COVID hit, and more importantly, when the Executive Order 109 uh, uh, took effect, which was the prohibition on, on the ability for hospitals to perform elective procedures, uh, we saw a precipitous drop in hospital revenues. The hospitals finished 2019 with a modest bottom line of about 4% across the state. Um, as we moved into uh, the April and May uh, with the prohibition on elective procedures, we saw about a $650 million a month drop in revenues uh, because elective procedures had fallen by about 91%. Uh, we also saw a significant increase of about 12% in hospital expenses, uh, mostly associated with uh, overtime pay, combat pay, uh, greater reliance on agency clinicians and, um, and ultimately purchasing PPE at, uh, at, at higher levels and higher prices, higher volumes and higher prices. So collectively, when we look at all of that, it pushed the hospitals in the state into a negative margin position. And best a guesstimate, if you can, on how hospitals are faring now. There has been um, some solidification of, of the hospital finances, especially in light of the CARES Act funding that came in from the federal government. Um, as crazy as it sounds, hospitals received almost $4 billion in, in relief money. And yet even with that, those funds, uh, the hospitals through September 30th uh, were still showing a negative operating margin with about 40% of the hospitals operating in the red. At this point, if there is not a ban on elective surgeries going forward, obviously, you know, we're in a situation where case numbers are rising again. Uh, will hospitals be able to recover some of these uh, lost revenues if we're able to maintain elective surgeries in the state? One would hope so. Although, as I mentioned, um, in April and May, um, uh, elective procedures were down 91%. Well, why not 100% uh, if there was a ban? It's, ultimately, you could continue to perform those procedures if it was an emergent situation. Uh, but when we looked, when the, ban, when the prohibition was lifted and we look at June and July, elective procedures were still down uh, about 25%. Uh, and then more disturbing or more concerning is as we look into through, through the first nine months of 2020, um, inpatient hospital admissions year to date compared to 2019 are down about 7%. Uh, outpatient visits are down close to 20%. Emergency department visits are down 25%. So there's a significant wound, if you will, a significant financial wound uh, that's going to take quite some time to recover from. What are we seeing in terms of staffing? I've read these articles, how they're bidding wars for nurses, for instance. 
across the country. Healthcare was always a bright spot in the overall economy in terms of job growth. We're recovering a bit from that, but what are we seeing here in New Jersey in terms of staffing levels at hospitals? Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a greater reliance from the hospital's perspective on the use of agency clinicians, agency nurses, agency clinicians to treat the patients as the surge ultimately uh, comes. And um, we, are in, in, we are in the middle of the second surge. If we go back to April, uh, the first case of COVID, the first positive COVID patient that went to arrived on March 4th. Six weeks later, we had 8,200 COVID positive patients or persons under investigation in a hospital bed. That dwindled all the way down to about 400, 425 by the time we got to August. As of this morning, we are over 3,500 COVID cases. That means more beds are going to be needed for these patients. It means more staffing is going to be needed to support those beds. And it's gonna put continued financial pressure on the hospitals. But the hospitals have done a uh, tremendous job in, in learning how to treat the disease. We are seeing that, that um, uh, the average length of stay from April to now is down from about nine and a half days to roughly six days. The number of patients that are requiring ventilation is significantly lower. Uh, so hopefully some of that will translate into to efficiencies, but you know, obviously the hospitals are there to treat the patients in need in their community. Uh, that's first and foremost what their mission is, and they'll do everything in their power to make sure that they can meet that mission. Absolutely. And of course, the entire state is so grateful for the work from our, our health industry employees. What will hospitals, when COVID passes, what will hospitals learn from this experience? How will perhaps things be different, run differently, if at all differently at hospitals, so that if we ever have something as terrible like this again, um, the hospitals can protect themselves a bit more? I think one of the things that the hospitals have learned is their ability to go ahead and, and staff up, uh, or if you will, add capacity. Uh, hospitals have gotten very, very creative. Uh, again, back, going back to the surge in April, which in some of this may be resurrected as we move into the, into the winter surge. Uh, hospitals are very, very creative in turning cafeterias and gymnasiums and unused space uh, into uh, rooms for additional beds. So um, when hospitals need to scale up uh, they now have that un under their belt, so to speak, in terms of understanding what it takes, how it's done to ramp up quickly, to provide more capacity, to meet the needs, should something as similar as this pandemic uh, hit sometime in the future. And of course, we hope it doesn't. We hope Sean it does Hopkins, not. Hopkins, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate your thoughts today. You're welcome. Imagine if we could just prevent COVID altogether, how different everything would be. Well, a New Jersey hospital is currently enrolling residents in a clinical trial for a therapy made by Regeneron. Now, studies have shown Regeneron's antibodies are effective at treating patients, but this study is looking into whether Regeneron's therapy could prevent the infection. The clinical trial is being conducted at the Institute for Clinical Research at Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck. Dr. Thomas Birch is the Institute's medical director. We need to prevent our healthcare facilities from becoming overwhelmed. And so we are interested particularly in outpatient treatment and prevention so that people don't have the complications of the, this disease and so that people don't even need to come into the hospital. You know what else we need to prevent? Cyber criminals from accessing healthcare data and disrupting all the work that's being done in the fight against COVID-19. A new report from the credit agency Experian finds hackers are trying to exploit the pandemic for their own gain. Michael Bremer, a data breach expert at the company, is worried about disruptions to the vaccine supply chain. What we've seen actively, especially with the vaccine, is that it's more nation state oriented and there, uh, there's a, it's a crime in the, in the case of China and Russia being involved they also have their own vaccines that they're making within country, but as best as we can tell, they're further behind some of the Western countries. So there is a, both a monetary as well as a reputational uh, angle for the, them to do that. The Experian report says cyber criminals are also trying to spread misinformation about the vaccine. 
Well, we want to thank you for getting your information from NJ Business Beat. Make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel and you'll get an alert when we post a new episode or clip. And are you a business interested in sponsoring NJ Business Beat? Contact Steve Priolo at the email or phone number you see at the bottom of your screen. I'm Rhonda Schapler. We'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com and New Jersey Society of CPAs, committed to the integrity, objectivity, competence, and professionalism of CPAs and the quality of their services.